Good morning, everybody. Good morning and welcome to Fellowship Bible Church. Welcome to all of you who are joining us online. Welcome, to, of course, to all of you who are here in the room together. So here we are, gathered together after a week, Lord willing, where we've been trying to walk with the Lord and worship the Lord and serve the Lord. And now we've come back to that time that he's given us to gather together. Whether you're here in the building or whether you're watching us online, God bless you. Great for all of us to be together. If you're watching online, I want to encourage you. Type a little comment in the section there, like a hello, a good morning, an amen, a hallelujah, or something. I've just learned that it's really encouraging when you're there. Don't just kind of lurk. Like, kind of let people know that you're there. And it's, uh, it's, that's really encouraging for everybody else to see. That way you can really kind of participate in the fellowship that way. That's cool. But, hey, everyone, let's all stand up together if you're here, if you're home. Stand up if you can. And I want to first read to you the words of a psalm, and then I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing praises to the Lord. All right? Now you got to put everything into singing your praises to the Lord. So, so get your mind in the right place, and hopefully this will do it for you. Ready? Psalm 97. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of isles be glad. Clouds and darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. A fire goes before him and burns up his enemies round about. 
His lightnings light the world, the earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax at the presence of Yahweh, the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. The heavens declare his righteousness and all the peoples see his glory. Let all be put to shame who serve carved images, who boast of idols. Worship him, all you gods. Zion hears and is glad, and the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O Yahweh. For you, Lord, are most high above all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. You who love the Lord hate evil. He preserves the souls of his saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Let us pray. Most holy Lord, Yahweh, we come to you. The only way that anyone can approach through faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, whom you gave to atone for sin, to redeem your children, Lord God, to redeem and save forevermore all who will humble themselves and put their trust in you. I can't enter your holy place. I can't come to you in and of myself. I have no holiness or righteousness to boast of in and of myself. You say rejoice in the Lord, you righteous. I'm not righteous in and of myself. Lord Jesus, you are righteous. You, the righteous one, suffered the penalty of the sinner that the sinner might by your grace and by your gift through faith receive the reward of the righteous. Imputed with your righteousness that we may now approach you, most holy Lord God, and with sincerity of heart, worship you and give you thanks. Thank you for your redeeming sacrifice. Thank you that you rose from the dead and destroyed all the power of death. Thank you that you promise everlasting life to all who believe your gospel. Thank you that your door is still open for people to come to you. Thank you that your word is still multiplying throughout the earth. Thank you that even through hardship and through difficulty, here we are and you sustain us and we're still here and we're still looking ahead to your kingdom. Thank you for how you bless us, how you provide for us, how you put us together, how you reveal your truth to us, how you open our hearts and our minds to receive the truth. Thank you, God, that you have reached into a sinful and fallen world and found us and brought us to yourself by the gospel of Christ. Praise your holy name. Now we bring you songs of worship from our hearts. And I pray that everyone listening, watching, everyone here in the room, that everyone would sing and shout to you and celebrate all of your goodness. And if anyone's listening or watching who hasn't been brought to you yet, use, Lord God, I pray, this assembly today to open their eyes by the power of your spirit. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship everybody. Here we go. One, two, three, four. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let his Lift one voice The mountains melt in your presence And the heavens declare your righteousness All of the world sees your glory oh, Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous Give thanks and remember His holy Oh 
the song. The song says that he loves us just as we are, right? He say, you love me as I am. Now, of course, his love for us is that he doesn't call us to try to fix ourselves. He calls us to believe and trust in him. And then his perfection, his righteousness is credited to us when you believe the gospel of Christ. Then, once you become his child, then he calls you to things like laying aside all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, having these promises, perfect holiness and the fear of God. And he calls us to walk with him. But still, even when we stumble and fall, he never leaves us nor forsakes us. And he's always right there, the wonderful loving father and a wonderful loving savior, just almost like cheering us along the way, if you would, as he calls us to humble ourselves before him, trust in him, believe in him, and serve him. Why are we saved? Not by anything we ourselves have done. We are saved and justified by his grace. That is all wrapped up in the gospel of Christ when you believe. So let's sing about that grace together. Take your hymn books out in the pews there and open to number 201, and we're going to sing Grace Greater Than Our Sin.
Good morning, everybody. Oh. Am I on? I haven't done this in a while. Am I coming out of the speakers in the room? I don't think so. My battery is good. I can't hear. He's trying to say something to me. Listen, brother, hey, listen, everyone. Brother Nelson is back. Yeah. <laughs> now listen. <laughs> Hallelujah. But we got, <laughs> we got about a year's worth of uh, bugs to work out, so I don't know if everything works yet, but I don't know. I'm talking, and uh, I, I, am I, I don't know. Am I amplified at all? I, I'll just talk real loud and... We'll figure it out after the service or something, right? We'll have, it all, we'll have it all up for next week, everybody. But Nelson's back. That's the important part, right? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, I, I'm, I'm looking back, and I, I, see, I see back there in the corner of the room sitting with my daughter, John Lacasio. And uh, John, just, uh, John just graduated from college. So congratulations to that. And... So it's that season again. I know the high school season is still coming yet, but anyone else, who, did anyone else in our church graduate from college this time around? Andrew, very good, congratulations. And who else? Anyone else? I know Josiah had graduated back in like January because he like got done. He's not here right now, but he had gotten done like, uh, he had like zipped through it and Got through it like ahead of time, so so we'll have to remember that one. Well, clap for his parents, right? <laughs> clap for mom and dad. All right. Well, congratulations, everyone. And 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 under the under the duress of the, uh, the current circumstances in the world, you know that's even uh, perhaps a little bit more of an achievement, having to adapt to everything going on. So, all right. Praise the Lord, everyone. Um, let us open our Bibles, please, to Acts chapter 12. Yes, Sunday school. So, so uh, who's here for Sunday school? Should I bring you up and pray for you? Or they already got, yeah, they're here. Come on down. Yeah, come on. Do you want to get prayed for? You can't say, someone asked you in church, you want to get prayed for. Is it possible to say no? I don't think so. So here we go. You want to check it out? All right, Nelson is back on the job. I think he just wants to get on the camera. That's all. That's all I Wave to the camera, Nelson. There you go. All right. All right. Let's pray, everyone. Where's Deacon Steve? Just come stand right there and just pray. Lead us in prayer. Lord of all, we thank you for the teaching of your word. Yes. We pray for these young ones who are going to learn it this morning. We pray that you will impress it deeply. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. Is there anyone else who, like, I, I, I acknowledge Nelson, which is awesome. Is there anyone else, like, today's like your first day back here in a long time or something? You've just been gone for a while? Is that true of anybody else? Is there anyone else that's your first day here? Welcome. God bless you. That's awesome. Praise the Lord. And everybody else, welcome to you too. Right? Everybody watching online, let's welcome them. Come on. Let's go. God bless you. Yeah. We're firing on all cylinders here. We got some people, got, got a nice room in the house. We got some faithful people that, that, that join us online every week. And yeah, it's going, man. The Lord's at work. It reminds me of verse 24 in this passage that I'm about to read, that the word of God just spread and multiplied, and it just keeps going on, and nothing stops God. You know that, right? You're about to see that, in case you had any doubts about that. Get ready. Okay, now Acts chapter 12. And actually back up to verse 27 of the previous passage, because I kind of missed that on the last Bible study. 
And let's look at let's look at that. Let's pray together first. Our Father, it's a joyous occasion to be able to gather together, Lord. It's a joyous occasion to have people in the room. It's a joyous occasion to have people joining us online and watching and listening and just praying and worshiping right along with us. It's a joyous occasion when people gather together because they love you, because they believe your gospel. That's the only way that anyone, Lord, can approach you. The only way anyone can call you God and call you Father is because your gospel reached them and you granted it to them to, to come to repentance and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. You are our Father, we boldly declare, because of the work of your Son. And we rejoice in you, Lord Jesus, and praise you. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit in us, teaching us, guiding us, comforting us. And as we read the word now, we pray that the work of the Holy Spirit would be evident in each one of us, instructing us and giving us strength, Lord, that we might live our lives, live out whatever you have for us here in service to you and for your glory, always trusting in you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, oh, here we go. Nelson's back. Just, let's see, look, look at that. Bang. Fixed. Let's see. Let's see what we got. Check, check. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. Oh. Amplification. Going to have to do some preaching here today, huh? All right. All right, here we go. All right, so let's start in verse 27 of chapter 11, and let me just read some of this to you. And in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them, named Agabus, stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Now, about that time, Herod, the king, stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Before you read any more, you know that when it gets set up like that, you know something's about to happen, right? Yeah. You, know, you know that bars and, and prisons and chains and soldiers and stuff, not going to stop God from doing what God's going to do. So here it comes. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise, quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Quick, get out of here. No, no, that's actually not what the angel said, right? The, no, this, this is a significant point. I'll, I'll talk about it more. The angel said to him, Gird yourself. Tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Now let's get out of here. No. Then he says, Put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. 
And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, you're beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it is his angel. Now Peter continued knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. Then, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what had become of Peter. But when Herod had searched for him and not found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. Now, Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, but they came to him with one accord, having made Blastus the king's personal aid. There's a name for you, Blastus. You got to be careful who you say that to, right? Hey, blast us. No, no. <laughs> the king's personal aid made them their friend. They asked for peace because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. Right? Because it was a famine, right? So on a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. And the people kept shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. Then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God. And he was eaten by worms and died. And then what I think is the most important verse in the whole passage. But the word of God grew and multiplied. And then verse 25 kind of ties the whole, the whole thing back together from where it started at the end of chapter 11, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. They picked up Mark along the way, right? When they, had, uh, they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark, which sets up the first missionary journey out of Antioch, which is going to be recorded for us in the next chapter. Okay, so, so let's just set this up. Uh, I have so, there's so much to say about this passage of Scripture, and I'll do my best to get it all through it today. Just do your best, like kind of follow along and listen and, and uh, learn some things because there's a bunch of like scattered things in here, but there comes, I think, one, one most important theme just in that last statement in verse 24, that how through all of this, God's word just continued right on spreading and people just continued right on getting saved. So we'll come to that. Um, Verse 27, at the end of chapter 11, tells us that in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. You remember in chapter uh, 11, we had read about what was going on in the, the church at Antioch there. And uh, we, back in verse 19, and I don't want to go back too far, but it tells us that people had been scattered and preaching the word and and everything, and they had gone to different places throughout Phoenicia and everything, and some of them came to Antioch, right? And some Gentiles began to get saved at Antioch. And it tells us in verse 24, a great many people were added to the Lord, right? And so Barnabas left from there and went to Tarsus to seek Saul, who he presumably had not seen in some years, right? And then he brought, them, brought him back to Antioch with him. And you're told at the end of that passage that that's where the name Christians first comes from, is from Antioch. So in those days, while all that was going on, uh, Jerusalem, the, the apostles leading the church in Jerusalem, uh, elders actually leading the church in Jerusalem at this point, as we see. We'll say something about that in a few minutes. 
um, they actually uh, sent a prophet there. And this prophet's name is Agabus, and Agabus comes up later in the book of Acts as well. And anyway, he makes this prophecy, uh, the Holy Spirit working in him, that there was a great famine that was going to come. And we're given a couple of time markers here, which is kind of neat, because here's like really, I think, the, the really first concrete place in the book of Acts where you can really see how much time has passed. If we take, I know the Gregorian calendar is not perfect, but if you take Jesus to have died and risen from the dead somewhere around 33 AD, then you look at this time and you see that this famine was going to happen in the days of Claudius Caesar, was the, the prophecy. And there are, uh, Claudius became emperor in 41 AD which is the same year that Herod Agrippa I, which is the Herod who harasses the church here, becomes king over what included Jerusalem at, at the time. He had a very spotted history, Herod Agrippa I. The Herod that comes later, that you see Peter stand, or Paul stand in front of and actually preach later in the book of Acts is Herod Agrippa II. This is Herod Agrippa I. And... Uh, so both of these guys kind of came to power um, in 41 AD. Claudius, uh, his successor was Nero. And we know eventually in the mid-50s, Nero became emperor. And then things got really, really bad for the, for the Christians, right? But um, we'll say more about that in a moment, too. But uh, so history records that this famine that occurred in the days of Claudius Caesar happened about four or five years into his reign. So around 46 or 47 AD is when this happened. So you can see now that from the time of the first outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost all the way until this moment here, you've had a little over a decade pass, right? So you've gone from 33 to about 46, about 13 years, 13, 14 years have passed. And the church has developed and and the gospel is spread. We've seen that the gospel, just as Jesus said, had been preached in Jerusalem. It had been preached in Samaria. It had been preached and uh, spread throughout Judea. You see this passage makes reference to churches and elders throughout Judea. And uh, now we're getting to the point where in the next chapter, in chapter 13, you're going to see the gospel just explode around the world as the first missions trips among the lands of the Gentiles begin. But this, this, uh, this famine is going to happen, and so what the church does in Antioch, right, what the church does is they decide, having been armed with this knowledge from God through this prophet who has spoken to them, uh, they decide to take a collection, basically, and it says that each one, according to his own ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea, right? And notice it doesn't just say Jerusalem, it says Judea, which means the church had spread beyond just the walls of the city itself. And so they did it, and they sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And something significant you can say about the use of the word elders there is that you don't see the use of what word? Apostles, right? So the fact that in that 14-year period, what has become like the church, the local church, the local assembly, has begun to take some form. And as more of the New Testament gets written, you get more formality put to it, and you can kind of understand a little bit more about church the way that we understand it now. But whereas the apostles, who were all Jewish, led the first church, that first ministry in Jerusalem, which was also entirely among Jews, now you see Paul and Barnabas taking this offering not to the apostles, but to the elders. You see later in the passage when Peter gets out of prison, he says, go tell these things to James. That's not James the apostle, because James the apostle was killed before Peter went to prison. That's James who wrote the book of James later in the New Testament. That's James, the half-brother of, of Jesus, actually, who becomes the leader, the elder, the pastor, if you will, of the, of the church at Jerusalem. So you see that the church is kind of moving from its, uh, the church in Jerusalem and Judea, is kind of making a little bit of a transition from being just overseen by the apostles into Jerusalem, 
in Jerusalem to the point where it's actually being led by pastors, elders who lead the different congregations throughout Judea, right? Uh, that's going to also then happen in the lands of the Gentiles as this uh, begins to progress, all right? We'll have more to say about that as we go on, especially when we get to chapter 15. Uh, there's an event that occurs that you really see the, the elder, uh, the head elder in the church, who is James, rise up and speak and, and, and settle an issue, a very important issue that had arisen. But that's what sets the stage for us, okay? Now, we're told in chapter 12 and verse 1 that about that time, follow along in your Bible with me, now, about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church, right? Now, uh, the, what you should know about Herod historically is that even in ancient writings of the Jews, this particular Herod, we look at him and we read what we read in the Bible and we say, wow, what a terrible guy. And uh, obviously, he, he, he just to satisfy some of his constituents, he murdered somebody here and was getting ready to do it to somebody else. In ancient writings of the Jews, this particular Herod is actually viewed somewhat favorably because he seems to have been friendly with uh, the Jews in Jerusalem at his time and was perhaps the most himself personally observant of a lot of the Jewish customs uh, of all of the, the Herod dynasty that reigned in that, in that particular time. So... Uh, and of course, what are we told here? Something that's very consistent with that history. It says that he stretched out his hand to harass some from the church, and he said he killed James, the brother of John, right? James and John, the apostles, they were the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, as they were called. They were fishermen. They were among the first ones that Jesus called. It says they dropped their nets and they followed him back early in the account of the gospel. So he kills James with the sword, and look, he saw that it pleased the Jews. And that's consistent with like, what we know of, of Herod Agrippa I from history, that he was viewed favorably by the Jews because he was able to do things that they were not heretofore able to accomplish. Do you see the transition of the persecution of the church from the religious leaders to the political leaders, right? The religious leaders first tried to persecute the church and Saul was their champion who they sent to haul people away. But then Saul was called by Jesus and got saved. And then everything changed, right? Now there is a king in place who wants to have favor with his Jewish constituency there in Judea and in Jerusalem. So he begins to persecute the church, right? What does the, per the, what does the church do about it? Well, we're not really told that the church does anything about it. They're persecuted by the religious leaders. They're persecuted now by their governance. And what do they do? They continue to preach the word. And they continue to pray. And even when persecution comes, what do they do? They turn to the Lord. And they pray. And they constantly pray. They don't get wrapped up in all of the, the violence. They don't get wrapped up in all of the bickering. They don't get wrapped up in all of the politics. They don't get wrapped up in any of that stuff. They continue to keep their eyes on the Lord. And what you see is when this persecution begins, what happens? Constant prayer, right? You see James killed. You see Peter arrested again, right? Peter's been in and out of prison a few times already, right? But you don't see vast protests against the government. You don't see uprisings or a revolution among those who are Christians. You see them do what every Christian ought to be doing all the time in persecution or in peace. They turn to God in prayer because they know that God is greater than what, and whatever circumstance may come their way. They know that God is sovereign they know that God's got this, as you might say. They know that God has some higher purpose in all of it. And so they turn to God and they pray and they pray and they pray. Um, so seeing that it pleased the Jews, he goes and he seizes Peter also. And we're told that it was during the days of unleavened bread, which are the days that lead up to the Passover. Right? So you're, you're right about the time where about a decade and a half earlier, Jesus was himself 
persecuted and then crucified. So what he plans to do, he arrests Peter, he puts him in prison, he basically gets a, a, a small army of soldiers to watch him, and then he intends, it says, to bring him out to the people after the Passover to see, what, to see if it would please the people if they put Peter to death as well. Now, let's just stop here for a minute because I want to point something out, and that is this. We've already read the story, so we know that Peter gets out of prison. And what question always arises here that provides sometimes a little dilemma for people is, uh, is that James died. And even though James had walked for three years with Jesus before his crucifixion, and now James is one of the apostles, and James had, Jesus had presumably invested all this time in James and raising them up. Why did the Lord let James get killed but preserve Peter? And some people look at that and they find a little bit of a dilemma with that. But what I want to point out to you is this. This is a very good and very powerful example of something that you should be reminded of concerning God that every person always needs to remember. And it's basic and it's just three very simple words. God is what? Sovereign. God is sovereign. God works all things together for good for those who love him, to those who are the called according to his purpose. God had his reasons. Why? God had his reasons why his time for James on earth was done. God had his reasons why his time for Peter on earth was not done yet. That's an example. That's a powerful example for us. I want to take the time here just to, there's so many passages of scripture that we can turn to to illustrate to, for you the sovereignty of God. I want to turn to one of the most famous because it'll be easily recognizable for all of us. Turn to Job, the Old Testament book of Job and chapter 38. And if you've read Job or if you've ever heard me talk about this or some other preacher in the past, you'll be familiar with this. Job is right before the book of Psalms. Chapter 38 is right near the end of the book of Job. Job chapter 38. Now, here's your quick 30-second synopsis of what happens before chapter 38 in the book of Job. You have uh, Job, who is this very righteous, God-fearing man, and uh, Satan, we're told in the beginning of the book, is walking in among, somehow having access to God on his throne, and God sees him and asks him, have you considered my servant Job? He's righteous, there's none like him, all this stuff. And Job, or, or Satan basically makes a couple of accusations of Job before the Lord in the beginning of the book. And God permits Satan to like attack Job up to a point. First, he permits him to attack him, but don't touch this. Then he permits him to attack him, but, but you know, don't kill him, you know, leave him alive. And Job ends up losing everything. And then the story of Job is basically this long conversation ongoing between him and some of his friends, his friends trying to convince him, Job, obviously you've done something wrong before God, because look what's going on in your life. Confess your sin so that God will forgive you, Right? Now, what is Job and all of his friends not aware of? The conversation that happened between God and Satan in God's throne room, right? And so what it is, is this. It's an example for anyone who would read it of the fact that even in the direst of our conversations, we, uh, in the direst of our situations, we need to trust in God. God knows what he's doing. God is sovereign. God might permit that difficult situation in your life because he has some higher purpose that you can't see. We are called to be reconciled to God by what? Faith. Faith never stops being the basis of our relationship with God. We are saved by his grace through faith and then we continue to walk by faith and not by sight. And so we must continue to trust in him. So it reaches the point in the book of Job where God reveals to him that it is him who has been in control and at work all along. And this is the way that the Lord does it, right? So I've, I've, I've kind of skipped all the, 
first 37 chapters of Job and all the hard stuff and got you to the good part, so to speak, in chapter 38. But you should read the whole thing for yourself because there's so many powerful things that get said. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? In other words, you're talking, but you really don't know what you're talking about. Job's gone through a lot, right? And God is not being like harsh with him, but God's being firm and direct with him because, again, the lesson is I'm in control. You need to be patient, you need to wait, and you need to trust me. Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? You're familiar with this, right? Tell me if you have understanding. This is God questioning Job. This is God questioning you and I. Listen, when we're going through difficult circumstances, when God is permitting trials, maybe persecution, maybe mocking for your faith, maybe you're getting attacked because you love God, whatever the situation may be, this is God's question to us as we are tempted to what? As we are tempted to worry, as we're tempted to doubt, as we're tempted to listen to bad counsel telling us, well, it must be because you did this or you did that, right? You know, God's not into karma, right? You know, God's not into like concepts from like other religions and things like that. You know, God is sovereign and God has his reasons why he permits certain things in our lives. And we get challenged about that. And here's what the Lord would say to us. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. little divine sarcasm there. Or who stretched out the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut the sea with doors when it burst forth and issued from the womb when I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band? When I fixed my limit for it and set bars and doors When I said, this far you may come, but no farther, and here your proud waves must stop. That's why I picked that song today about that I'm I'm, I'm your beloved, because it, it makes reference to the fact that he commands the oceans and their waves, right? God is the one who basically determined exactly how much water there would be on the earth, where it would be, and then basically, if you will, said to the water, stop here, right? So next time you go down to the shore here in Jersey this summer, because the good weather you got, you saw the forecast for this week coming. There's like 80s and stuff like that coming. So Sam, you're going to want to go down to the beach and all that stuff, right? Next time you're standing at the beach, you stand there and you look at that sand and you look at that water and you tell yourself, God told that water, you stop right there. That's not, that's not preacher jive. That, that, that's real stuff. You understand? This is, this is, this is God who, who spoke and these things came into existence that didn't before exist. You can also go on to read chapter 40, verses 1 through 5. For time's sake, I'm not going to do that. Chapter 42, verses 1 through 8. Turn back to uh, Acts because I want to keep the narrative going there. You understand the point, though. God is sovereign. What is it for us to do? Beloved James is killed. Beloved Peter is in prison and might be killed. Beloved Peter is let out of prison. Why did God spare Peter and not James? James must have done something. That, you know, I, I remember that time. When, and listen, we're all sinful. We're all sinners. We all mess up, right? So I remember that time James said this. I remember that time James said, no, no. God is sovereign and we trust in the Lord. Why did God allow me to get COVID? You know? And I sat there and I was like struggling with it, you know? I had to go to the hospital and get a treatment. Doesn't God know that I preach every Sunday and I give out the gospel all the time? This is really inconvenient. Not for me to ask those questions. Lord, you are in control. And he chose to deliver me. He hasn't delivered everyone. There are even beloved brethren and even preachers and pastors who have succumbed. Why? Why did James die? Listen, this is why we are called to do exactly what this church did. Constant prayer. See, you ready? 
here's the thing. When Paul wrote to the Colossians, and he, remember, you know that prayer that I did the Bible study out a couple weeks ago? You know that I pray that prayer for you guys every single day, right? I, I go down the list of names sometimes and name them. Sometimes I just pray for the whole church. But I, I like to pray that prayer that's in, that's in the beginning of the book of Colossians. Right? That he prays for them that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that they would walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, uh, uh, filled with every good work, fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, that they would be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for perseverance and all long suffering, and that they would be thankful because God is qualified to be them to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints and the light. The first part of that prayer is that God, the first part, the very first thing is that he asks God that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That's the first part of it. That's what this is about. Why James, not Peter? Lord, what are you doing? You have a ministry for us. I mean, maybe they're still reeling because they remember years before when Stephen was stoned. And they were all persecuted, right? And then God allowed Saul to actually haul some of them off to prison. And some of them even went, uh, some of them were even killed and Saul was consenting to it. And then Saul got converted. Why didn't you convert him before? So number, listen, God is sovereign and we trust in him. And that's why the prayer is, Lord, fill them with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. We look at God's will, and this is, listen, listen, listen. We look at God's will, and this is what we do with it. We shrink it down into a box. And on this box is a label, and the label says, me. And what we understand God's will to be is, God, what is your will for me? And we want to know, Lord, what am I going to be tomorrow? What am I going to be a year from now? What am I going to be five years from now? How's my life going to go? We want to know, what job should I do? What, what uh, car should I buy? You know, what person should I marry? Perfectly rational and, and things that God wants to lead you in. All of them. But may I suggest to you that God's will is much, much bigger than the little box that says me on it. God's will is what he is doing in the world. One of the reasons that we don't know God's will and we struggle with understanding God's will is because we look for it in all the wrong places. We turn on the evening news and we think if we follow the news and understand what's going on in the world and try to piece it into Bible prophecy in some way, which in case you haven't noticed, no one's really been able to do that, at least, at least in the entire years of my life, yet. You know, everything is supposed to signal the second coming of the Lord. Everything is signaling the Antichrist is here. Everything is signaling the world is coming. To Listen, there are cult groups that are famous for prophesying dates and times of the return of the Lord. What part of... It is not for you to know the dates and the times and the seasons which the Father has in His own authority, but you will be my witnesses when you receive power, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. What part about that don't we understand? Amen. We look for God's will by watching the news. We look for God's will by surfing social media. We look for God's news by surfing some time for the most sensationalized and the most hysterical things concerning this or that. And then you throw in there a pandemic and all this stuff that goes on with it and all the politics and elections and, the, and everything else. I'm not saying those things aren't important. I'm not saying you should be ill-informed. What I'm saying is you're not going to grow closer to God. You're not going to be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding if your whole life is spent looking for truth and looking for satisfaction and looking for purpose and looking for involvement by engaging in everything in this temporary fallen world. You know where God's will is found? It's found in verse 5. It's found in the words, constant prayer. You know the will of God by walking closely with God. His will is in him. 
himself. His will is revealed here. You read his word. You meditate on his word. Are you Bible people? You're Christians, right? We're all Christians. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe the gospel. Are you Christians? Do you read his word? Do you study his word? Do you know his word? When there's a Bible study or a sermon or, or something, do you listen? Or do you just fill up all your time exposing yourself with stuff that's never, ever, ever going to draw you closer to God? Got the, got the microphone going today. Right? It's, it's all right. Yeah. So, so you understand? No, what did, what did they do? He, see, here's the point. Here's why I say that little statement tagged on to the end of this. And look, I'm not going to, don't worry, I'm not going to keep you here all afternoon. This is, this is going to start today and it's going to end on Thursday night. So everybody take a, every, everybody, every, let, everyone let a nice breath into your mask go. A nice, a nice safe, COVID-friendly breath. There you go. Lou's not going to keep you here all afternoon. All right, so this will be, this will be followed up on Thursday night. I kind of knew that was going to happen anyway, right? You, you, didn't, you didn't look at this whole chapter and think we ever got to go through the whole thing in one night. You've known me long enough. So, so in any case, what, what happens is, and I totally lost my, fra- my tra- train of mind with that little diversion there. So, so in any case, you have, the, you have people who are looking for God's will. And they're wondering what God's will for their life is. And they go searching, we go searching for all the wrong places for God's will. And of course, the thing that we forget is that God's will belongs to who? God. So we have to spend lots of time with the Lord. And we have to devote ourselves to the Lord. And so that's why when you read this, look, when Jesus taught us to pray, what did he teach us? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That, that's, that should dominate. I, when I pray, I'm not, I'm not putting myself forth as a model or anything like that, but when I pray, in my head, for years I've done this, years, I have the Lord, what the Lord taught us to pray in my head, and I follow it like a checklist in my head, right? So, our Father in heaven. And I just dwell on that, right? And I just start worshiping him, because that's what it is. It's worship. Hallowed is your name, right? And you go through all of that, right? And you're praying through. You use that as a guide. Because Jesus gave that, you know, in a response to teach us to pray, right? Okay, here's how you pray. And he tells, okay, so it's good good enough for Jesus, good enough for me, right? Right? So we pray. And then you come to the part where it's like, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then I start thinking about all the things I have need of in my life. All the requests that I have from other people. And all of the issues and concerns of our church and our ministry. And everything. Everything. My care for my wife and my care for my son. My care for my daughter. My love for so many of you. And in this part of it, so many of you, probably at one point or another, every one of you is, is mentioned in that time that I have with God. Let your will be done, not mine. Lord, and, and sometimes I tell God what I think, but it's always let your will be done, not mine. That's what we're taught by Jesus to pray. Let's be people who are devoted to the right thing. This is why I say to you that the most important thing in here is verse 24. Look at it. Maybe I'll just save the rest of this for Thursday night. That'll make everybody happy. right? But I want you to see verse 24. See, these people understood what God's will was. They were filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. While everyone's wondering about Herod and what he's doing, trying to satisfy his constituency there in Jerusalem by murdering one of the apostles and putting another one in prison, getting ready to murder him, while all of the Christians are correctly just praying and praying and praying and praying and praying, Right? 
while, while eventually Peter's going to get out and then you have this famine going on and history records that lots of people died from starvation in that region of the world in this famine. It was a very serious famine, so that's the backdrop of this whole thing. And while you have one of the regions, Phoenicia, which included the cities of Tyre and Sidon, we're told later in the story, uh, complaining and, and making the king's aid blast us, their ally, so they, he could go and persuade them because they were at odds with King Herod, but they needed food from King Herod. So, so they have King Herod coming in, and, and, and history actually records that Herod I planned games. The Romans loved their games, right? You've seen Gladiator, you've seen some of these movies, right? So the Romans loved their games, so they planned these games in that region of the world, and it, part of those games, as history records, uh, uh, Herod Agrippa I got up and made a great speech. Secular historians record that the, that the, uh, the, uh, the crowd, adoring crowd, tried to make him a god, exactly as the Bible records, totally corroborates what the Bible says, and that he suddenly died as a result of them. You have all of this stuff going on, right? And then you get verse 24, which is the most important thing in the whole thing. But while all that's going on, oh, by the way, God's still working. See? See? Filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. What is God's will? God's will is that his word is spread. God's will is that the gospel goes forth. God's will is that the ministry of saving people by preaching to them repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that that continues to spread and go forth and more and more people get saved and more and more people are taught God's word and more and more people are grown up as disciples of the Lord. That's where, listen, where did the book of Acts start? I just quoted it before. What's Acts chapter 1, verse 8? You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That's why he told them to wait in Jerusalem. You're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and in all of Samaria, and even to the uttermost part of the world. The whole theme of the life of the church, listen, 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 as revealed all throughout the book of Acts, and as is continuing to be unfolded for 20 centuries, 21 now, including now, what is to be continuing to be unfolded right here through you and I, and through you watching this online, who are Christians, is that we are his witnesses. God is not interested in us getting wrapped up in anything that pulls us away from all of that. And I know I sound like a broken record or I sound like a fanatic or I sound like a weirdo or I sound like, I don't care what I sound like. You should know that by now. But, but, but the, the, the point is that like, I'm pleading and pleading and pleading with every Christian that I possibly can because what we are called to is this, to be, I want to be part of verse 24. You know, I, and, and you know, I want to be part of, uh, I want to be part of verse five as well. I want to be part of, uh, you know, the, the constant praying and all that that's going on. But I especially want to be part of verse 24. I don't want to get wrapped up in the Herod this. I don't want to get wrapped up in the Biden that or the Murphy this. I don't want to get wrapped up in the, you know, Fox News says this and CNN says that. I want to get wrapped up in God's word. And I got wrapped up in my prayer room where I shut the door and pray to the Lord who sees in secret that he may reward me openly. I want to get wrapped up in carrying gospel tracts around and everywhere I go, you know, I go here, here, take this. Would you read it, please? Take this, would you? And maybe someone will say, hmm, what is this? And I'll have an opportunity to share Christ with them. I want to get wrapped up in inviting people to come to church so they can sit and listen and hear about Jesus. I want to get wrapped up in using whatever little tiny sliver of influence I might have on social media and in the rest of my life for Jesus Christ and his gospel. Do you believe that Jesus is going to come again one day? Do you? Do you really believe that? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is actually going to come again one day? Do you believe that with him will come the visual, physical manifestation of the kingdom of God? 
And as the book of Revelation says, he will rule for a thousand years. Do you believe that? Everyone good? Do you think that Jesus will get wrapped up in the kind of stuff that we do? Hmm. Hmm. Well, there's something to chew on in your mind, isn't there? Because when Jesus comes again, he establishes the kingdom of God here on earth and rules for a thousand years. And you know what you're going to do? If you're in him, you're going to be with him. We're not going to kick back and relax. You're not just going to, you know, update your Twitter feed all day. We're going to serve him. Do you know that? Do you know that when we go to heaven, you know that when we're with the Lord forever, it's not to just sit there on some celestial lounge chair and kick our feet up. We're going to serve him forever. Did you know that this life that we're walking... Listen, you want to know why James was sacrificed and why he lost his life? Because his life was about preparing him to serve Jesus forever. James didn't die. His body died, but his spirit is with Jesus now. And he will one day receive a new body at the resurrection of the saints. And he will serve Jesus forever. God's perspective, the knowledge of his will, all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Folks, I don't care what you think. I love you all. I'm, not, I'm using that rhetorically. Of course, I care about everything, about every one of you. I hope you do the same. But listen, irrespective of what anybody may think, this stuff that sounds so fanatical is reality. And all the stuff that we claim and submit to as being reality is all temporary garbage that's going to be gone one day. Here's what matters in this story. But the word of God grew and multiplied. And that's how it always was when they were persecuted. Every time you read of some, some death, you know, all the, all the cities are named after him. You notice that? Antioch, right? After Antiochus, you know, the, the, the king who tried to uh, put a statue of himself in the temple before Jesus was on the earth. He's the, he's the human precursor of Antichrist. Antiochus, Epiphanes IV, right? And then Caesarea, Named after Caesar, right? Philippi, named after King Philip. Over in Egypt, Alexandria, named after Alexander the Great. We do it here, Washington, right? There's even one named after me, St. Louis. Good. I practiced that line. And it came, it came off pretty good. They name, they name, listen, listen, they name all these cities after themselves. What's it going to be like when Jesus returns and puts his feet on the Mount of Olives and it splits in half, as Zechariah said? And he rules. Listen, start serving him now, man. This is the reality. This is the reality. The reality is this. Here it is. Here's something solid and sure that you can hang your soul on in this life. And there isn't anything else. I am the way and the truth and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life, says Jesus. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus died for our sins. Jesus rose from the dead. All the power of death over his children is destroyed. As he said at Lazarus' funeral, he who lives and believes in me will never die. As he said to Nicodemus, God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will never die but have everlasting life. Come to Jesus. Listen. Left alone to our own devices, the best we can do is try to clean ourselves up before God, try to be religious, and hope that he'll like us. Never going to happen. We have broken God's holy commands. Our lives are filled with lies, covetousness, lust, slanders, blasphemies, murders, even in the heart God sees that. Dishonoring of our parents. 
making every matter of anything else in our life God before the true living God. Multiply that out by the number of days and hours and minutes in your life. And you see the preposterousness of thinking that any man can justify himself before God. Wake up, people! You need Jesus. God giving Jesus is the one way that men can be redeemed. Men can be saved. God's wrath against all of this sin. Listen, Jesus is coming again. It's not going to be a little baby in a manger that everyone's going to put little statues of in front of their lawn, right? At Christmas time. And then, and then argue about it on Facebook, right? That's not what it's going to be. No, no, what's going to happen is he's going to return and the justice and the judgment and the wrath of God against all sin is going to be brought. And those who are in him by faith will be saved and will be redeemed. So whether you die from this life or you live to the day that Jesus comes, if you are in him, you are justified before God and you are saved before God by his grace. But if you're not in him, you should run to him. Because there's no other way. Certain eternal judgment in hell. A lake of fire that burns and is never quenched awaits those who leave this life without the redemptive work of Christ applied to them. And the only way that happens is through the sovereign grace of God a person comes to repentance, realizes that there's no way they can, by religion or anything else, clean themselves up. They are sinful before God, and it matters. And it doesn't matter that I'm better than that guy over there. It doesn't matter that I'm like, well, he does this and this. I would never do that. It doesn't matter that you can find a couple of other people to kick around to make yourself feel good. None of that will justify you. Come to Jesus, the Holy One, the only Holy One. Come to Jesus. Believe on Him. Trust in Him. As many as received Him, to them He gave the power to become the children of God. To those who believed in His name. Run to Him. Come to Him. Pray to Him. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You're a Jew. You're a Gentile. You're a man. You're a woman. You're old, young, rich, poor. You have sinned and you face a holy God's wrath. And the only way to escape happens to be the most perfect and loving thing that was ever done in the history of the world. Jesus died for your sins. They buried him. And on the third day, he rose from the dead. And that is all of it. His power unto salvation to everyone who believes. Come to Jesus. If you need to come to Jesus, believe on him. If you need more help with that, come talk to me. Write to me online. Come speak to me. I can direct you more, help you more, pray with you some more. If you are in Christ, if you are in Christ, recognize the sovereignty of God. Recognize the will of God to spread the word of God. Come away, come apart from all of the distractions of this life and devote yourself to that which is true and real, which is serving the one who redeemed us with your life. There's so many more details in this story. I gave you the beginning and the end. You tune in Thursday night, or you can even come here Thursday night and you get the middle, okay? Sound good? Right? So you get the bread today, and then you get the inside, of the, you get the peanut butter and jelly on Thursday. Right? You got it? That's how it works. There you go. All right. Good. Very good. All right, I love you all. I, ho I hope you all love God, and I hope you all love one another. Let's be serious about this stuff, all right? This is the truth. All right. Let me ask, please, Fanny and Isabella and Ken to come on back up here. And we're all going to close with a hymn, which is number four. Oh, not, we got the numbers back up on the sign even. It's starting to look like church again. How about that? All right. 409, everyone. Let's stand up, and then we'll close with a prayer after this. 409. I... So my wife is our alto, and she teaches Sunday school. 
So she's downstairs, so I don't have my alto. My bass is making his way up here, and uh, we have our pianist here. But, but I, 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 I do have use for an alto if uh, ever you like think that that's it. I talked to one or two people already, and we can have a rotation. It doesn't have to be the four of us all the time. And uh, so if you're a singer and you feel like being involved with singing some a cappella and singing some harmony and singing along with the piano, let me know, okay? That fell on silence. <laughs> yes, Pastor Lou. Yeah. 409, everyone. I know who I have to leave. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Now, um, we have a large crowd. Uh, it's a great blessing that uh, we've been able to have all of the windows open and the doors open. That's all to like have some ventilation in the room. But now we're going to all go and have the best ventilation, which is kind of the way we do this now is uh, as soon as we close with a prayer, uh, we're gonna go, all going to go outside, okay? And when we're outside, it's beautiful, it's warm, there's no rain, nothing like that. We're just going to be able to stand like at a safe distance and just enjoy some fellowship outside. No hustle to go home, but we're going to clear the room in here and everyone's going to go out. Okay? Got that? That's how we've been doing it and that, that's been working out really great. Um, uh, we do receive an offering at our church and uh, we don't actually take it like, you know, the way we used to, but I think you know how it goes now. There's a box on the table in the foyer on your way out. If you want to put your offering in the box, you can do that. You can also mail something to the church in the old-fashioned snail mail way, and uh, the deacons will take care of that. You can also give online, 
and uh, I think most people know how that works now. Um, if you have any questions about that, wave your arm, Deacon Steve. This is Deacon Steve. If you have any questions about the online giving, see Deacon Steve, okay? Finally, <clears throat> I will point out to you that Memorial Day weekend is two weeks from today, right? It's actually the 30th because there's the 31st is the actual Monday holiday, so you get like five Sundays, I think it is in May. So, <clears throat> so it's the 30th. We're going to do something. It's not all great, great, great news there, right? But, you know, we did like, like, last, like last year at Labor Day, we had like an outdoor, uh, we're all going to have lunch kind of thing, like bring your own lunch, and we all sat outside and, and uh, we ate. Um, we're going to do something like that, but it's going to be two weeks from today, probably like two o'clock in the afternoon, and we'll meet outside in the yard where it's all safe and everything. More details will follow. It's not all worked out yet, but we're going to do something. So plan on, plan on the Sunday of Memorial Day. Listen, even if you're not here for church, if you're watching from home, you're, you're welcome to come too, you know? You enjoy it at home, and then by two in the afternoon, come on over, we'll all spread out in the yard and, and just have a really good time of catching up with each other and one way or another eating some food forever. It's probably gonna be BYO, but maybe we'll do some kind of like hybrid thing, okay? All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Deacon Steve, nice and loud, close us in prayer, please. Thank you, Lord, for the teaching and preaching of your word and for the uh, great uh, comfort it is to us. We pray that you help us to uh, remember these things all this week and, and uh, live as your witnesses uh, throughout our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, let's all say goodbye to our brothers and sisters and friends who have joined us online. Goodbye. God bless you, everyone. Have a great day, everyone. Goodbye.